Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying with us. What a great start for the RTR 2024. We already had great discussions with the opening session. And in fact, we, I took note of some key words here. Results, resilience, inclusiveness, synergies, affordability. And all these aspects are extremely important for what we're going to discuss today. The future of network and traffic management. So I'll briefly introduce the panel that we have here with us. Sasha Hohendorn Lancer, representing this for Trump. Panos Georgakis from Frontier. Hunar Sohesen, representing the orchestra. Juliette Thies Tangent. And I'm also pleased to share also the stage with Serge Van Damme, which we're also going to be leading the Q&A session. My name is Thiago Tavares. I'm a program coordination manager at the transport and infrastructure and cities sector at CINEA. I also have the pleasure to, have, to be the project officer of the project we'll be presented today. And I think we're going to see very interesting results presented. So just to give an outline on what we'll be discussing, first there will be a brief presentation on my side. We're going to then hear from the projects. And then we're going to have a dedicated session for the Q&A. So let's start by imagining two situations. First, you are going to the airport this morning because you decided that you will come to the RTR in the morning. And in fact, you take your train. Everything is going well until a moment that you have an incident on the track. You start thinking, OK, how long does that take? Am I going to lose my flight? And actually lose the opportunity of being in the RTR and delivering this amazing presentation I've been preparing for a long time. But what if, while there is this issue in the track, there's a discussion between the mobility service providers. And they not only coordinate among themselves, but give you alternatives on how can you arrive to your airport the fastest way possible. And even better, when you arrive at the airport, they automatically give you priority, get you the fast lane to the security checks. Wouldn't it be better? Let's check a second option. So you were more cautious, you arrived yesterday. And of course, you, faved, you booked your favorite hotel, which is just a tram ride from the bull point where we are now. But what you didn't know is that there are planned works on the track. So the tram is not there, and there are replacement buses. What you also didn't know is that your hotel became quite popular. So most of the 350 attendants today decided to book the same hotel. And it's the only day of the year where there is 10 centimeters of snow. So your time calculation before and after all this knowledge certainly has changed. But what if there would have been a communication between the service providers? They would be aware of this event, of the weather, and also of the planned disruptions on the track. And in fact, all of the attendees of this conference, they will actually be informed and communicated on which route to take. These are just two examples on how traffic and mobility impacts our life. The European Commission is supporting research and innovation to develop the network and traffic management of the future. For instance, CINEA currently has in its portfolio nine horizon projects which focus on this topic and a total EU contribution of 45 million euros. In this session, we're going to hear from four Horizon 2020 projects, did for Tram, Frontier, Orchestra, and Tangent, which are part of the forefront cluster. They are in the final year, so we are looking forward to see the, the results. And they are working together to answer those questions that we are talking about and many others. For example, these projects are expanding research and developing new tools. 
new tools that use AI and digital twins to predict the bottlenecks based on the information that they have in terms of weather, events, or disruptions. They can simulate and evaluate traffic management response plans and provide you with good alternatives. They promote the fair cooperation between the service providers of the different modes. This can be road, water, but in the future, who knows, air as well. And of course, we are talking about the future, so definitely looking into CCAM. And what's the objective? To optimize the transport network, optimize the transport infrastructure, to make transport more resilient for both the planned and unplanned events. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the first speaker. Each of the speakers have 15 minutes to present. It's important to keep track because we started a bit late. And the first, Dr. Sacha Hohendorn Lancer, the Director, Mobility Innovation Center Delft at TU Delft, and also the coordinator of Dit for Trump project. Sasha. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tiago. Uh, Sasha Hogeman, working for the Dit for Trump uh, project. I always have to look because I hate these acronyms, distributed and intelligence uh, and technology for traffic and mobility management. And hopefully within 15 minutes, you know what I mean by that. Let me first introduce uh, our consortium. We consist of 20 partners throughout Europe, uh, from academia, uh, consultancy, industry, governments, working together. If I say we, I always mean one or more of the partners within the project, and our budget is approximately 5 million euros. Why did we start with the project? We see an increasing complexity. M move a bit. Oh. oh, you can give me that. No problem. Is this, this is working, thanks. No, we see an increase in connectivity and complexity in all our society and also in our transportation uh, network. We see changing objectives and requirements. We move away from just looking at accessibility towards sustainability, equity, inclusiveness, safety, all the, the, the objectives also that Tiago just mentioned. We see that demand get more and more personalized. And we also see diversification when it comes to, uh, to different mobility services. It's difficult to manage a full multimodal system in one go. So what we're uh, looking at is seeing if it's po uh, what the potential is to do that in a decentralized or distributed uh, manner, taking into account all of these contemporary objectives. Um, quickly go through the objectives, of course the technical ones and the societal ones. First of all, from the technical perspective, we want to design in a smart way that distributed interaction and uh, control strategies, trying to get as closely as possible using that decentralized approach to get to a system optimum. Secondly, to minimize the, to minimize the amount of information flowing between one system and the other. Think a, a bit like a 5G system where you want to keep as much information as possible uh, locally on the edge and only move the necessary information, for example, to a cloud. And last of all, to determine the effectiveness of the approach of that decentralized or distributed approach that we're applying. We don't do it just for the technology. What we want to do is to uh, achieve the societal objectives. We want that transition towards a seamless, sustainable, connected, autonomous mobility system contributing to all of these different things, livability, safety, resilience, but also keep in mind things like privacy, participation, and fairness. What we hope to achieve at the same time, it's not the main objective that we had, but what we want to do as well is try to see if using this decentralization, if we can reduce the costs. The costs of our sensing or monitoring network, of our communication, of our maintenance, and at the same time also improve the robustness of a system. 
if your system is largely decentralized, if one thing go, goes back in part of the system, then the rest of that will hopefully stay functioning. Quickly, like I was asked, let's go into the results. We have different application fields for this decentralization. Um, and all of them are linked to pilot sites. Let's quickly go through them. The first one is uh, in Bordeaux. It has the lowest, the, the smallest time in geographical scale. And what we first started with is simply run scenarios. And we did that in a digital twin environment where we um, um, brought together a replica of all of the systems, uh, data streams, etc., of that specific location. And in that setting, we tried out what the impact would be, for example, of uh, prioritizing cyclists at such an intersection. It's a crowded intersection. There are pedestrians, cars, cyclists, there's public transportation. So what would happen if we prioritize, for example, the bikes? In, this, um, in these simulations, the results, the impacts were very good. So the next step that we took is see if it's um, technically feasible. So we actually gave people an app that functioned as a virtual push button. And in that sense, we checked if the system would technically uh, work. What you did see in practice is large improvement for cyclists, but what you did see is unacceptably long waiting times for cars. So what we're currently looking at is to better um, uh, balance the waiting times for the different transportation modes at that location. That happens if you practice a presentation always in your normal mode and not in the, the running mode. Okay, that was the Bordeaux one where we had a technical test and a simulation test. Here we're looking at the network of, uh, of Utrecht. We have already decentralized control on the motorway network around Utrecht and we see that we have an 80% reduction in delays on the motorway. What was the next step that we were going to do? We looked at the smaller part inside the city or call, uh, called it Gooilijntje. There, there were reconstructions, the capacity for cars was reduced and, and we uh, applied a control, uh, a control scheme that prioritizes both public transportation as well as cyclists and pedestrians who want to cross the road. It works perfectly. There's only one problem. We use very expensive data collection to have the system running. So what we're going to do in the next step, and we're going to do that actually, or are currently doing that in another project, the follow-up project, is to see if we can replace that rate of detection by the use of floating car data. And um, what we want to know is how by how much we can reduce the cost in that sense, but also if we can keep the same level of effectiveness. And that follow-up, we're not going to do in Utrecht, we're going to do that in, uh, in Rotterdam. The next uh, step, even a bit broader in terms of geographical scale. We're looking at reinforced learning when it comes to parameter control. I'm not sure everybody knows what that is. What it basically means is that you want to influence the amount of traffic getting into a certain part of the network. And we're combining that by decentralized queue control of uh, the, all of the traffic lights within the area. So it's combining what gets into an area and at the same time making sure that the flows within the area are as smoothly as possible. We didn't implement this in practice. This is a virtual pilot. It's done in, uh, in Athens. But what you do see is that in the simulation context, you have almost 36% um, time spent less in the network, but basically means that traffic can quicker flow through that part of the network. I think it's an elegant method. Um, it's easy to implement. It has limited requirements when it comes to uh, data and communication, and it outperforms other approaches that were applied and could be found in, uh, in literature and are, in fact, a bit more complex. Currently, we looked at one part of the network. The next step is to look at different parts of the network and also look into the interaction between these different network parts. This one is 
uh, looked at both in Lyon and in Amsterdam, and it's about tradable mobility credits. What if I would give you a certain amount of credits that you can use yourself to decide how to travel. If you decide to travel by car, it will cost you more than when you decide to travel, for example, by pu public transportation or to go by bike. The question is how to allocate these credits to users, whether or not people can trade these credits. If you're not traveling this week, can you sell your credits to another person, but also how in the end you're going to use it and how that influences the flows in your network. Um, it was implemented in the whole city of Lyon in terms of a simulation and it outperformed the more traditional approaches like the congestion charging as well as the uh, license plate rationing. Um, what you see, and I'm, no, you can see it better there, what you see in the graph um, on the right, you see that if um, you charge people more to travel by, uh, by car, in the beginning, nothing happens, but at a certain point, you see that congestion is part by part uh, relieved, which means that travel times on the roads get lower, so total travel time of the system gets lower, but at a certain point, if too many people are going to travel by public transportation, public transport takes you longer than the car in non-congested situations, then your total travel time goes up again. These simulations, um, use behavioral parameters in them uh, and they tell you how you assume people would respond if you would set up a system like this. What we're going to do in Amsterdam now is try to, uh, to reveal these uh, behavioral parameters. So to really look at the system from the perspective of uh, the traveler. And we're going to do that in March and April by organizing large scale uh, series gaming sessions in which we, lead, we let people make multiple choices, but also let them see what the response would be on the network. Then the last example, I hope I'm still in time. Um, earlier I talked about the users of the system. This part of the project is about the people providing the services. So if you introduce, for example, a ride hailing service in a certain area, often you see a decline in the use of public transportation. But if you have that decline in ridership, it often means that you also have a reduction in the public transportation revenues. And if less people are traveling with public transportation, you see in the end the level of service for public tra transport uh, go down. So you come into this vicious circle. So the, the way in which we try to solve the problem is to geofence around the public transportation stops, which in uh, practice means that um, the ride hailing services cannot stop uh, to drop people off or to let people in near the public transportation stops. And what you, what you can expect there to see is that the geofencing significantly increases public transport demand, but it also has a negative impact on the ride hailing uh, revenues. I think it's good in the end to look what it means in terms of total costs for the ride hailing companies, uh, for the public transportation companies, but also from a traveler perspective. Because if I'm not allowed to be picked up at my doorstep and I have to work through a public transportation step, that also means additional costs for me as a traveler. Now, very quickly, my last two slides about the project impacts. Um, I think as a, uh, as a team, as a whole, we achieved the scientific objectives that we had for the project. We have a large number of publications, conference contributions, keynote speeches. We're currently working hard to get the knowledge that we uh, gained in the project disseminated, for example, to PhDs and to professionals. So we're setting up a MOOC, but we're also organizing, and everybody is welcome, the beginning of July in Delft, a summer school where all of the people uh, will present. If I look at the virtual pilots, then you see that they reveal the type of impact that you expect. And we're happy that we could achieve that with the decentralized approaches. And if I look at the real life pilots, they show the technical feasibility as well as the user acceptance. This is for the short run, a bit further. Um, when we started this project, we had the idea of one big dynamic traffic management system. In the end, we didn't uh, 
come up with that. And that's basically because all of the countries, but also different parts in the country, have different uh, systems. So what we come up uh, with now is a selection of solutions, which hopefully will find their way and get integrated into the traffic management systems in the different locations. We've done some virtual pilots, for example, uh, for the um, uh, tradable mobility credits. What we're doing now in follow-up projects is try to really get that towards um, a real implementation on the road. For example, in MetaCase, a very familiar project for you with Tiago, we're going to look into that. We uh, received last year a fund for the Emeralds project, and within that project, we're going to build up on the work uh, that we did in, uh, in Utrecht. Um, and of course, see in which way together with business partners, we can yeah, let all of the results that we achieved within the project in an optimal manner. I hope I kept it within 15 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to take the questions at the end uh, because of the time. And first of all, uh, thank you very much for keeping the time. I think that was very important. And as we were talking about results, there were two things that uh, I took note here from the pilot, which I think is important. For example, for the multimodal network control pilot in Utrecht, which included, of course, the prioritization and decentralization of this decision, including the bikes, there was a delays reduction of 18%. And the use of tradable credits addressed something that's very difficult, the behavior change with increase for more than 40% of public transport. So let's keep those in mind. And now I'm looking forward to hear the presentation from Frontier, where we're going to have Dr. Panos Yorgakis, Professor of Intelligent Transport System at the University of Wolverhampton, UK. Uh, okay, hello everyone. My name, my name is Panos and I'll be presenting the, the Frontier project. Uh, another long title uh, for a project, so I'm not going to go through reading all that. Uh, but just to give you a, a very uh, quick overview of um, the project. Um, so we have uh, 19 partners for eight, eight different countries. Uh, we started on uh, the 1st of May of 2021, so we are now in the final stretch. We have uh, three months remaining, and during those last three months, we are aiming to uh, sort of carry out the majority of the demonstrations that we planned originally uh, for the platform. And um, in terms of the objectives, this is how we started. So this was the, the concept that we used, uh, and, and the objectives uh, cut across many different sort of areas of, of traffic management. So the first one is really to identify the current state of affairs, if you like, when it comes to traffic management. So uh, during the project, we, we carry out a number of workshops uh, with, with the key stakeholders, and we try to sort of, you know, paint the picture of the current traffic management systems. Um, and we also look at, um, you know, this, uh, developing, if you like, a, a technical architecture for uh, the frontier solution, which I'm going to uh, explain a bit more later in the presentation. Uh, and then we try to sort of divide all the different innovations in, in four um, areas. The first one was about observation of the network. So this is the one that deals with the data collection. Uh, and again, I'm going to explain what kind of uh, tools and, 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 and results we produce on that. Uh, the second one was the orient um, layer, if you like, of our uh, solution. Uh, and the idea was really to sort of, uh, you know, get this raw data and try to do something useful of them. Um, and, and, and again, I'll explain a bit later how we approach this layer. Uh, the, the next one was about decision making. So, okay, we have all this data, we process all the data, what can we do? Uh, and again, within that, we uh, develop a number of tools that can support um, the, 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 the construction, if you like, of, of, of response plans and, and, and the deployment of those response plans into networks. Uh, and the act is about, um, you know, how do we, we, we monitor the 
response plans in real time and how can we talk, um, take actions uh, in a continuous way to be able to improve the situation of the traffic network. So uh, this, these were the four, if you like, layers of the, of the solutions that we, we, we set out at the beginning of the project to achieve. Um, we also look at some non-technical aspects, um, looking at different things like business models, arbitration models, what happens in situations where, where you have conflicting interests between the different operators, uh, and we try to incorporate all that into the uh, different sort of uh, results that we produced. Uh, we have uh, three demonstration sites, uh, and we, we have live demonstrations in all sites. The, the one in Athens is uh, looking at uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration. So this is where we have different operators uh, working together to resolve a, a, a situation in the network. Uh, we had a, a multimodal uh, pilot demonstration in Adverb. This is where, uh, in, in that location, we are looking at road, but also waterways, and how the two can actually, the two different corridors can actually uh, work together to improve again the situation in the network. And the, and the last one was in Oxford in a race. In Oxford, we were looking uh, at a more urban, urban level uh, of traffic management, and we also have a live demonstrations with calves and I have a video uh, later for you to, to watch. Uh, and again, of course, uh, the last objective was all about dissemination and exploitation of, of the project results. Uh, so just to give you some highlights of what we have produced so far in terms of, in, in terms of results, um, a part of the project was all about using AI tools for network management. And I think Tiago mentioned earlier in his initial sort of talk about we need to have ways to be able to detect incidents. We need to be able to have eyes on the network and, and try to, uh, you know, uh, as predict, if you like, situations. Uh, early on. This is not as easy as it sounds. There's a lot of talk about, there's a lot of data out there. Uh, sometimes this data may not be uh, correct to start with. But also what we found out during the project is that when something happens on the network, you receive information from different sources. And, and, and as an event, uh, let's say, expands and propagates on the network, uh, you keep receiving this information and at some point you need to realize what the actual incident is, what are you actually trying to solve because the situation may get worse very quickly. Uh, so again, as part of the project, we developed a number of different tools to be able to sort of estimate the traffic state in areas of the network that is not supported by any technology, sensors. Uh, also, uh, traffic state prediction to see how we can actually uh, predict the, the, how uh, uh, an event may sort of escalate in the next sort of uh, in, 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 in future uh, time horizons, but also most importantly to be able to detect incidents. Um, and, and again, uh, here is where we try to use data to do this. And as I said before, uh, you know, sometimes this wasn't as easy as we thought originally uh, because of the quality of the data and, and the availability of historical data in, in some cases. Uh, we also developed a number of uh, transportation models. So we found transport transportation models to be very useful in, in the activities of the project. Uh, different kind of models, one for urban uh, environment in Oxfordshire. We created a corridor in Athens to, to, to look at uh, uh, motorway traffic, but also look at this sort of uh, collaboration between different stakeholders. By the way, the one in Athens is the, is the corridor that connects to the, to the airport. Uh, and we try again there to look how different stakeholders can work together to re resolve situations on the network. Uh, and also looking at the multimodal network uh, situation where we have a corridor, uh, two corridors, one, one road transport, one on waterways, and, and see how, how this works. We use these simulation models to actually assess response plans um, and, and, and also use these simulation models to test different CAVs scenarios for the future. Uh, now, the main sort of output of the project is what we call this autonomous network and traffic management engine and the idea is to be able to somehow support existing uh, traffic management systems uh, even from the outset of the project it was very clear to us that there is a lot of 
uh, systems available, so we didn't want to replicate what uh, is happening at the moment. We didn't want to take to, to ask, let's say, st stakeholders to replace their traffic management systems with something new because that is not very well accepted in most cases. So what we thought was we, we, we said we are going to create something that's going to sit on top of the existing systems and try to somehow, um, you know, facilitate collaboration between different uh, operators. Uh, and the diagram I saw you at the beginning was rather complicated, but following workshops and discussions that we had with stakeholders, everything came down to three very uh, unique operations as part of traffic management. The first one was the incident detection, which, which I mentioned before. So everyone said we need something that can actually give us you know, information about an incident, and we need to have the same awareness about the incident. Uh, a lot of times what we found out during the project is that different operators have different views of incidents that take place on the network and may not have the same perception of the impact of those incidents. So the first thing they said is we need to have some common awareness. We need everyone to know what everyone else knows about an incident to be able to, to, to talk to each other and collaborate. So that's the first part of this sort of uh, concept of operations that the solutions we developed were, were based upon. Um, the next thing was, okay, we know there is an incident, an incident, we need to decide when and what to do. Okay, so this is, this is part of the response plan generation. So we need to know when something has to change on the network and, 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 and what that is. And as part of the project, we, we develop um, a response plan generation sort of component. Again, this is not only works on individual operators. It, it has actions that cover different services, traffic management for roads, uh, public transport services, etc. Uh, so, because again, the operators have to decide in a very short period of time. You cannot provide a lot of, you know, information to them. They have to be able to use uh, enough information to make an informed decision, but we cannot overload them with a lot of information. Uh, that's why we, we develop a recommendation service component that sort of summarizes the information on the response plan and presents that into, in, in, in a user-friendly way to the, to the operators. Uh, and then, of course, one of the main objectives of our project was also to have this sort of uh, environment where operators can actually agree on a response plan. So we have, again, uh, an operator of a, of, a, of a motorway, we have an operator of an urban uh, traffic control center, we have public transport operators, they all have to agree on a response plan. And again, this is one of the sort of uh, innovations during the, during the project that um, we thought we handled quite well. Uh, once they agree on, on, on a response plan, then we have to sort of monitor the impact of that response plan in real time. And, and this can be done in, in different ways. And at the end of the clearance, if you like, of the incident, then we need to find out how, how well the response plan actually performed. So again, these are a, a set of tools that we developed to, to facilitate all this process. Uh, so again, as, as, as um, results that we produced, we, we created a dashboard to allow the different operators to work together instead of using their individual systems that they may pr uh, present different information in different way that's not understandable by everyone. We sort of talked to them and we came up with uh, so some dashboards that provide information to all of them at the same time. Uh, information about events that take place, uh, information about the response plans that can be sort of uh, deployed on the network. Uh, and we also developed an application that can take the users, uh, the actual travelers, into the response plan, into the traffic management, let's say, in general. So again, uh, routing is an ine inevitable sort of functionality, but routing wasn't our primary concern in this case. Our concern was how can we use the travelers as part of the entire network management solution. Uh, so the travelers can actually uh, instigate um, you know, the, the detection of an incident. Of course, we need to be able to sort of verify that in, in different ways, and, and this is what we, we try to sort of uh, do uh, during the tools. And then the travelers, of course, they have to receive information about the response plan to be part of the, of the uh, traffic management. 
Uh, we also, another aspect of the project was actually um, demonstrations with the calf. So what we tried to do, and again, this was something, again, one of the other innovations we thought of the project was really to uh, communicate response plans from a traffic management center to an autonomous vehicle. Okay, so not having an autonomous vehicle, uh, you know, operating as a black box, we wanted to demonstrate scenarios to say, okay, there is a, there is a, a closure of the road, we need to communicate that to the uh, autonomous vehicle, and then the autonomous vehicle has to take a different route. Uh, and we did different sort of scenarios with, um, you know, speed limits, variable speed limits, road closures, etc. And uh, one of the last uh, uh, results we produced was uh, um, a classification index for smart infrastructure. So through, throughout the project, we try to sort of record and, and, and uh, all the different aspects that need to be part of a potential classification index uh, that, that kind of give us some indication about the readiness of infrastructure when it comes to traffic management. And again, this was all about uh, looking at the, at the CCAM, but what we found out during these activities was that, you know, you can only look at the digital side of things, you need, you need to look at the physical infrastructure as well, because the autonomous vehicles have a number of sensors and they try to sort of understand the infrastructure. So the infrastructure itself must have some specific standards. So we came up with a classification index uh, to allow, let's say, to evaluate the, the, the readiness, if you like, of infrastructure to support CCAM services. Uh, I think I'm just going to quickly go through the last couple of slides. I have one minute left. Uh, in terms of the in terms of the KPIs of the project, we are, we are there is a, a list of KPIs that we are going to try to to, to monitor uh, during the pilot demonstrations that we have in about four weeks' time, and they are all re related to traffic management, mainly related to how can we sort of produce a model shift between uh, road or you know, private vehicles and public transport, how can we improve the overall network capacity, uh, how can we improve the safety. So we are planning, we have, we have come up with uh, methodologies to be able to sort of um, quantify all these different targets during the live demonstrations that we have in four weeks and hopefully we can provide more information about that in the final deliverables of the project. And some more long-term impacts, I think these go back to a lot of things that we, we, we heard today. Uh, and, and these are the kind of sort of different areas that we're going to try to sort of incorporate in, into our exploitation plan for the different solutions that we developed. But it's all about, you know, the economic impact of, of, the, of, the, of, of the traffic management or effective traffic management can have. Everyone talked about jobs today, new skills and jobs. Um, environmental and social important impacts as well. We have a, a, a number of different sort of areas that we, we, we can report upon. Uh, and also looking at the future trends in terms of mobility, multimodality, and how the CCAM, uh, CCAM services can be part of the future of traffic management. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I think uh, what I noted down here is in line with how you managed your presentation as well. When you identified that there was an incident that was going a bit late, you quickly communicated with, uh, you know, and go very quickly and finished on time, which is exactly what we want when we are traveling. We also want to finish on time. And I think it's important that, of course, there is a lot of work behind to make sure that all these systems work to each other. and. One thing that is mentioned from Frontier is also that, of course, the collaboration between the stakeholders, it's also a big issue that this project is trying to solve. Uh, now, we're going to pass to the next presentation from Orchestra, and I have the pleasure to invite Rune Sorensen, which is a Senior Business Development Manager at ITS Norway. He's also the coordinator of Orchestra. Thank you so much, Thiago. So, uh, I'm here to present the Orchestra project, uh, which is about a new and resilient multimodal traffic management ecosystem. I will not go into detail regarding the acronym Orchestra. That's, I don't remember it myself. So, first, a few words about Orchestra. Uh, Orchestra is a Horizon 2020 research and innovation action. We have 15 partners from six different countries. 
It started in May 2021 and will end April this year. And uh, we plan to have a final event together with Frontier uh, at uh, co-located with TRA in Dublin in April. The budget is approximately 5.1 million euro. And as said, it's coordinated by TES Norway. Uh, a very important pillar in our project is our two living labs. We have one living lab at Hera Industry Park in Norway, focusing on traffic management in the support of movement of goods, connecting uh, public roads with private roads inside the industry park and also to sea. And then we have Malpensa Airport, in Milan, Italy, where we are focusing on uh, traffic management, supporting the mobility of people, uh, both to and from the airport and also within the airport. I think uh, the Malpensa Airport Living Lab perfectly addresses situation one that Tiago introduced earlier, that uh, delayed passenger, maybe due to a train breakdown, can have priority through the security control and so on. So, uh, what we are talking about in orchestra is moving from today's traffic management to traffic orchestration. Our vision is to enable a future where it is easy to coordinate and synchronize the traffic management of all modes and across modes. And we want to provide traffic orchestrators with tools to cope with diverse demands and situations. And please note that orchestra uh, and the results try to be relevant for all modes, including road, rail, sea, and air. Uh, to contribute towards this vision, we have four specific objectives. Uh, establish a common understanding of multimodal traffic management. Define a multimodal traffic management ecosystem, where traffic management in different modes and areas can be coordinated. We want to support the realization of the multimodal traffic management ecosystem towards deployment. And we also want to validate and calibrate MTME, which is multimodal traffic management ecosystem, regarding organizational uh, issues, functionality, usability, and so on. Uh, towards these objectives, we have defined six key results. We establish uh, a knowledge base on evolving needs, requirements, and the feasibility based on a target vision. Uh, we will develop a policy and strategy white paper and roadmap, which shall provide recommendations to policymakers. We are developing a policy-centric multimodal architecture, I'll come back to that for sure, uh, which specify collaboration and interactions both on an organizational level, but also on a technical level. And we have lessons learned from pilots, simulation, and, and trials. Last but not least, we have two toolkits. We have an enabling toolkit supporting the realization. This includes decision support tools, simulations, and training of traffic orchestrators. And we have a deployment toolkit, which is focusing on uh, providing guidelines for organizational and business models. So, uh, I will go into more how our activities have contributed to these results. So, uh, knowledge on evolving needs, requirements and feasibility. The project has established a shared vision of uh, multiple traffic management ecosystem towards 2030 and 2050 time horizon. Um, and this vision, uh, we have identified barriers, enables opportunities, acceptance, and social impact. And our vision has been validated by external stakeholders, uh, which is what we call our community of practitioners, which are external to the project that has been invited to particip participate in workshops. Based on the vision, we have identified enablers for future multimodal traffic management ecosystem. Common da data spaces that allow exchange of information between the different modes and governance areas, uh, adapted policies and regulations, new smart infrastructures supporting also connected and automated vehicles and vessels, 
We have looked into uh, use of machine learning or artificial intelligence for efficient decision making. And we have also uh, looked into uh, what is needed regarding adapted and new business and organizational models. Policy and strategy white paper and roadmap. Uh, uh, we will deliver, deliver a white paper toward realizing efficient multimodal traffic management, which is uh, based on our target vision. And we think and really hope that this will be an actionable outcome uh, that might lead to legal and regulatory actions. Uh, we have identified need for standardization uh, for several parts of the systems. And the white paper also take into account the ongoing automation automation, both on the transport side of vehicles and vessels, but also automation of the traffic management or the traffic orchestration. Then we have uh, what I mentioned earlier, a polycentric multimodal architecture. Uh, this is a reference architecture for multimodal traffic management. It includes many perspectives and specifies collaboration and interaction between the diverse systems in the ecosystem. And this shall support deployment and exploitation after the project. In short, the polycentric multimodal architecture provides a concept model what def uh, that defines what multimodal traffic management is, defines the roles of the main stakeholders in the ecosystem, it provides an architecture view which uses standard software engineering notations. A motivation view provides drivers and goals for the stakeholders. A context view describes the functionality needed for each part of the system. And a component view, which is, comprises information models and interfaces. So you can see a simplified uh, uh, illustration of the polycentric multimodal architecture to the right and note that we are focusing on the traffic side and the traffic orchestration facilitating more efficient transport of all modes. And uh, in parallel to develop this polycentric multimodal architecture we have de developed a board game uh, which has provided really useful in discussing the different aspects of future multimodal uh, traffic management, and we have played this at several uh, occasions, both with, uh, um, the, um, with external stakeholders and being present at uh, different uh, venues playing this game. has been very useful. Then we have lessons learned from uh, our pilot simulations and trials. I already mentioned our two living labs, uh, and they have been used to define use cases. Uh, used as open innovation arenas. They have facilitated exploration of new concepts for multimodal traffic management. We have integrated uh, proto, uh, traffic management prototypes and also used this to collect real-time and fused data. And this uh, have, has enabled us to evaluate new strategies and tools covering both normal situations and disruptions. And important for us is that both of these living labs uh, span several governance areas with, uh, where different uh, stakeholders are responsible for uh, part of the traffic management. And uh, in addition, I use simulation to scale up uh, uh, the ex exploration of the living lab cases. So then to the two toolkits, the enabling toolkit, which provides decision support and traffic management prototypes, uh, training modules for tra future traffic orchestrators, assessment tools supporting evaluation, and then we have the deployment toolkit, where we have uh, outlined organizational business and market models, uh, substantiated by suggested contractual and administrative implementation. So, uh, now uh, I try to show how these results can contribute to the mid and long term expected impacts. 
So what you want to go from is traffic man management in silos, as shown in the bottom of this illustration, to traffic orchestration across modes and governance areas, connecting these silos. And this, uh, this enables us to focus on the entire transport system, uh, enable, enabling coordination across transport modes and networks. And this further enables new dynamic measures for traffic management and increased resilience of the transport system. And uh, this will uh, provide better support for multimodal door-to-door transport services and chains, both for people and goods. And also support individual transport operations. So we can uh, give individual guidance uh, to uh, transport network users. So, but to leverage this future multimodal traffic management, uh, an important prerequisite is data sharing. We need collection and use of high quality, diverse and GDPR compliant data. Uh, we, we need real time data sharing that facilitates coordination and synchronization between transport modes, uh, which enables uh, problem solving of forecasted and unplanned situations. And it also leverages new opportunities for cross-model optimization of transport. And this is also supporting the environmental and efficiency goals of the transport sector. So uh, we are uh, eager and looking forward to the developments of a common European mobility data space. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rune, for the presentation, for keeping the time. And I took note of three things which I think are very important. First, coordinate. The second was synchronize the different modes and make sure that you really have a multimodal approach. And of course, this is only possible if you share data. And I should really follow the results from the project which will come very soon and see how you can actually apply this into your ecosystem as well. And last but not least, we're going to hear from Project Tangent. And I'm pleased to invite Juliette Thais from Project Officer at Polis. Okay. Hi, everyone. So today I'll be speaking about Tangent. But before I go into the project, I wanted to go back a little bit into the basics. So what is traffic management? What, what is its goal? Well, it aims to help keep traffic flowing, to minimize delays, to mitigate traffic impacts of events like roadworks and accidents. However, the problem today is that traffic management is still car oriented. The vehicle centricity of traffic management is at odds with today's city transport strategies that are prioritizing sustainable mobility like SUMPs. So we need projects like Tangent, Orchestra, Frontier, and did for tram to support to reach multimodal cities that promote and support sustainable mobility. And I believe that our projects are doing just that. So in a nutshell, Tangent is developing complementary tools um, to support multimodal and dynamic traffic management. We have been doing this for the last two years. We're entering in our last year. We're a small consortium of 13 partners led by Deusto University. And uh, we have four demonstrations in Rennes Metropole, Greater Manchester, Lisbon, and in Athens, a virtual case study. Now, the key concept is that we are first developing um, R&D tools, which are improved travel behavior modeling, traffic network prediction and simulation, and transport network optimization. I'll go into these in the results. And what these are enabling are enhanced information service for multi tr multimodal transport management, real-time traffic management services, and transport network optimization for transport authorities. So basically, everything in this project is connected. 
by looking at the user, the system, and the data. And how do we bring all of this back to the transport um, authorities and um, operators? So the results. The biggest result of the project is um, a dashboard, which connects three services that I just presented, the three last services, together. What it does is that it enables um, transport and traffic managers to have a multimodal perspective of traffic. It brings in different modes, for example, um, I mean, obviously vehicles, car traffic, but also buses, metros, rails, um, together so that there is a comprehensive view of the um, traffic management in the city. And it is made for traffic managers, but also public transport operators, roadside road service providers, uh, such as um, Google Maps and other in-car services, and public authorities. And it provides the status um, of real, provides real-time information on the status of the transport network, but also predictive information. So what happens if um, an unplanned um, event happens? How, how does uh, the traffic management or the control center, what can they do to improve the options available? And how did this tool come to be created? Through multi-actor co-creation processes. So this is something that I believe has been very strong in Tangent. We have been in loops of workshops in the four uh, demonstrations, looking at what is the current state of the data, who has access to the data, what is being shared, what is not being shared, why, who's communicating together, why are they not, uh, what are the real needs, what do they want to test, what kind of scenarios, what if we did this, what would happen. So the, the goal was from the start of the project to really try to understand the needs in the four demonstrations to be able to tailor traffic management tools that enable to predict what would happen in SARS, but also to support um, developments in the public transport uh, field and in other mobility modes. Then uh, a second, I mean, a third uh, result. So, what is behind all of, this tool, all of these tools? So there's three big innovations. In terms of transport prediction and simulation, there have been um, innovative data-driven methods to estimate the demand um, in traffic management using machine learning um, and using new data-driven methods to predict um, real-time context. And what were the, the tools that were used behind this will loop detectors to measure the traffic, journey times on road segments, bus, tra bus trajectories from GPSs. So a lot of data was collected in order to predict and simulate how the traffic management would react um, in different scenarios. And um, so data was collected on historical and real-time data sets, external features like road information or weather and time series. Then um, this data was included into, looped into a tangent API that was looped into the dashboard, which was the result number one. Then travel modeling was done. So how do users react if we add a mode? How do they react if the price of a mode increases? How do, we, how do they react if they have to take public transport instead of taking their car to commute? So to model travel behaviors, there was a number of surveys that, was, that were done in the four demonstrations. And um, there was data that was collect, collected on real-time journeys in those cities. So the preferred, preferred and revealed preferences were compared in order to develop a model to see how users react. And then finally, new data harmonization and fusion techniques um, were developed in Tangent in order to make sure that the huge amount of data that was accessible in all the cities could be fused, to, fused together. And one of the ways it was done was by creating metadata catalogs in order to make sure that everything could be connected and um, be used. Because data availability and sharing are one of the biggest problems um, or biggest barriers in developing multimodal traffic management. And this is why with the Forefront cluster, we've also worked on a on a white paper on data sharing and data governance, which will be available real soon. And I think it has some very good results 
um, and some recommendations from all the projects on how do we actually do this, especially between public and private operators, and how do you do this under the realm of GDPR? Um, yeah, one of the biggest challenges in traffic management. And then finally, um, behind this dashboard, there was also um, an expectation and, and, a, and a desire to help uh, transport or authorities optimize transport network. So how was this done? It was done by, by the creation of common operational pictures and response plans that were pre-generated. So for example, if um, in a city uh, the metro, a metro line fails, how do we make sure that a predicted response plan has been, has been made so that, for example, um, signals prioritize buses so that pe people can move from the metro to the bus? Or how do we make sure that uh, the transport system is resilient to big events that are planned? when, when, when the, the, the transport network is saturated. So a, a number of these um, response plans and common operational pictures were integrated into this dashboard. So there are modules in the first dashboard that I presented that, um, that the demonstration cities can plan around, discuss, and, and set up some, some frameworks um, in order to define what they would do in different scenarios. And uh, so this is how it all comes together. So the, the travel behavior modeling, traffic network prediction and simulation, and transport network optimization have all fed into the three services that you see below, which are integrated into this dashboard. We have a video um, that has just been finished today, which I will be publishing today maybe, or tomorrow, on the tangent uh, LinkedIn and um, Twitter, and it's a very short recap of two minutes on a very concrete uh, case, an imaginative case, that explains how this dashboard is supporting multimodal traffic management. So I highly recommend to go watch it to get a better understanding. And finally, the mid to long-term expected impact of the project. Well, I've taken a very high level on this one. But I believe that our projects are a stepping stone to enable uh, network traffic management to become truly multimodal and to support our cities to become sustainable and livable. And of course, by, by doing this, we are reducing congestion, greenhouse gas emissions, improving safety, sustainability, ease of use of a more diverse um, multimodal system. In addition, something that's been really um, valuable, I would say, is that in the demonstrations, with the in-person workshops that have been going on, a lot of actors have come together that had previously not had uh, the most clear discussions. So we, had, we brought um, around the table a big diversity of actors that are needed to create multimodal um, transport networks. So the public authorities, the, um, the, the um, sorry, the transport authorities, uh, public transport operators, all of these actors were together for long, deep workshops to discuss about how do we actually get there. And I think that was one of the really nice impacts um, of this project. And finally, the strong collaborations between the EU-funded projects, which are all here today, we've really been trying to go further than just um, collaborating on dissemination and communication. We've been working on white papers. This week we'll have a two-day um, uh, event where we'll be really trying to think about, okay, what is the real, what is the real need here? Well, how do we get to multimodal traffic management? What well, technologies are ready? Which ones are not? What are the policies that are needed in place? Um, and yeah, I think it's been a really nice uh, collaboration. And yeah, so that's uh, what we have been up to. And follow our pages to see those results. We will be disseminating them. And that's it from my side. Thank you very much, Juliette, for the presentation. And uh, I took note of a few things here which I think are important. I think the dashboard, indeed, I mean, there are a lot of dashboards, but I think it's important, indeed, the way it's organized so that you have real-time information. You get 
predictive plans, responsive plans that can be used. And of course, a key factor, which I think was, was really highlighted by Juliette, was the co-creation, because we are talking here about a multi-actor. So, and it's important that from the beginning, you involve them in the process, because otherwise the chances that they're not gonna collaborate quite high. And I really agree with Juliette, I think these four projects, they worked very well together and uh, for their own initiative, and they really managed to make the impact much higher. So I think that's really commendable and we would expect to have all the projects do the same thing. So I think, thank you for, for that, because I know it's not always easy because you do have your own grant agreements you have to follow, but you still find the energy to connect the dots, which I think is very important. So uh, we just learned from four projects now. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. And to guide you through this uh, Q&A session, I'm pleased to invite Serge Van Damme from Hike Water Start to lead you on this. My name is Serge Van Damme. I indeed work for Rijkswaterstaat. At Rijkswaterstaat, I'm the principal advisor on traffic management. Um, and I'm also uh, co-chairing the CEDAR. The CEDAR is the Conference of European Directors of Roads. I'm also uh, chairing, uh, uh, together with Manfred Harder from Asfinach, our working group on connectivity, automation, and data. And until recently, I was uh, in the administration board of the CCAM Association. But uh, my main role is to be in traffic management and to advise on how to develop traffic management. And I really like when you see something like these projects where traffic management is once again a, a nice and overseeable reality instead of the messy business it is every day out on the roads. The dangerous work our road inspectors are doing, cleaning up accidents. Um, uh, that is uh, uh, the winter surface, uh, uh, wrong way drivers, managing uh, roadworks, all the things that happen outside in the real world on a motorway network. Um, that is one part of the business, but on a more conceptual level, I'm really happy to see that we're making a lot of progress as was seen in the projects here. And it's very useful for us uh, the, to help us with fresh ideas and to help us with real uh, concepts that can be used in our practice as well. So to move just from response, also to be more proactive. This is really the dream of all road authorities, I must tell you. Um, okay, so um, first of all, I would like to offer you the opportunity to uh, ask questions. If you have made any notes, have any burning questions you would like to uh, uh, pose, please let me know, raise your hand, and I'll run to you with the microphone. Yes, very good. And I'll keep the microphone. Okay, hello, uh, Anna from Rice. Uh, I, what, I was wondering, what was the main challenges to have all these different systems and models to synchronize? Was it lack of data, very different approach from different systems and so on? Uh, your view from working with it. I don't know uh, which project you're asking, but I can try to answer. Uh, it's not uh, firstly, the lack of data, Any but uh, of the lack of willingness to share the data, both related to competitive issues and also, for example, liability issues if you share data that, that are not 100% uh, correct. Does that answer your question somewhat? Would you like to ha ha have any other, other projects answer? Uh, yes, uh, so f from our side, I think, uh, okay, the data, I think it's, it's an issue that uh, I think um, cuts across probably all the projects. I think uh, for the data, there is, there is a, a number of um, uh, issues like, like Runar said in terms of the sharing of the data. I think we found out also that some data are not of very good quality. Um, but for us, what was uh, also quite um, quite interesting to find out, again, because we're looking at different sort of operators and different stakeholders, is to see the different perspectives that they have when it comes to traffic management and how that could maybe, you know, be sort of a, 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 a negative factor in, in, in allowing those systems or those models that we develop to actually work together and be, be deployed in, in, in real environment. Do you want to contribute? Yeah? 
I, I want to agree with the latter comment you made. It's uh, very nice to show in a virtual pilot what you can achieve, but it's so difficult even in Bordeaux to get one uh, intersection, have your systems running. And I'm very happy at some locations that we actually achieved it, but I think that's one of the most difficult things to do. How to, yeah, because they have to change things in their current system. Yeah. And, and it's scary. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's also an operational street where people need to move every day, so you can't uh, completely mess up. Huh? Uh, but at least to get some proof of concept is quite difficult. Yeah. Excuse uh, me, uh, may I compliment yeah. on, uh, on this sure. issue? A very interesting issue. Uh, just uh, one thing regarding data. We are uh, working on multimodal traffic management and uh, definition and understanding of the data types can be very different between the, the modes. So we need a quite extensive metadata catalog to understand the data. And secondly, since we are at the road transport research conference, I think the road sector has a lot to learn from the other transport modes, especially sea and air regarding collection and sharing of data. Thank you. Thank you, Runar. Good point there, I think. Yeah, there's, in each mode, there's a lot of data standards developed with national profiles and everything, but across them, are, would you ask this to the Commission to take this up? It's a clear finding, huh? <laughs> yeah, as I presented, we will provide a, a white paper at the end of the project, and this will be touched upon in that white paper for sure. And then we for sure need to work hard to reach the right audience and policy makers for that white paper, yes. Thanks, thanks. Okay, so for your question, Hamid, so, uh, no, you don't know, you first. <laughs> yes, very impressive projects, liked it very much, all of them. And also understand fully the potentials and the benefits it can generate for the society. But have you also considered that this amount of information and data in the wrong hands what could happen then? How do you, do you understand the liability issues, safety, security, all of those? In the, what we have, it works. 99.9% .9 of people come to their jobs today just because the old traditional way it works. Now we are stepping up. And there are risks. How do you treat those risks in your projects? Good point. I mean, thanks. So trust cybersecurity, um, uh, privacy, all those issues. I can try to answer uh, again. Of course, it's very, very important questions that are uh, raised here. Uh, we have not developed a complete risk analysis regarding uh, sharing or misuse of data. But what we are, have stressed is that we are not talking about open data in every occasion. It's a need to know basis and you probably need some kind of data intermediator that can provide necessary data to those with uh, authority to use those data, yes. Okay, so this is just for the project or? I don't uh, understand the question. Did you organize this just for the progress project, or is it? Yeah, this is a research and innovation project, so uh, we are outlining what is needed uh, regarding uh, barriers and technology to uh, exploit and uh, deploy the results. We have not done anything specific in the project related to this. No, Thanks. no Thanks. technology related to this. Yeah. From other projects, how did you solve these issues? Um, I, th I think for us, the, the trustworthiness of the data is a very important aspect. Uh, of course, we, we, we came across different situations where, um, you know, different operators say, okay, how do I know there is an event? You know, I cannot trust the, the information. You know, I need to see it with my own eyes. I don't care what everyone else says. I really need to see it with my own eyes. So that creates a bit of a, a bit of a, I would say I would say problem. It's like an obstacle when it comes to innovation because 
you know, how do you move from the current practices to, to, to maybe to the future where you have to trust autonomous systems, where you have to trust data. Uh, and, 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 and this, uh, this, is, th th this is a big challenge. So, and I think maybe this is where, uh, from, from our perspective, this sort of uh, mechanisms that were put in place when, when it came to this sort of traffic management platform to have uh, these different roles and, and, and this sort of governance side of things as well to say, okay, if there is information about the incident, on the on the motorway, we are going to trust what you know this operator is going to say. We don't really need to have an extra you know set of eyes on the on the particular spot to be able to verify that there is an incident. So I think I think trustworthiness of the information and the data is is a very important thing for the future as well. Yeah, yeah. So, but I also think Hamid's uh, in, in Hamid's question there was a bit of a warning. Uh, Hamid, I know you well, and uh, there's also I think the warning to be aware of creating new vulnerabilities. If you put everything in one place you're, and that gets compromised, it's, it's a, a new vulnerability maybe. Yeah? Can I, can I yeah. add something? Sure, it's, first um, and then I'll go. Oh, ma, ma, yeah. Sorry, no, but I think you need to work closer with different uh, types of specialties. We have a uh, pending project now, which uh, primarily about data security. We work with data scientists. So you need these other types of expertise, not just uh, traffic and transport engineers. So that's, I think, uh, an important thing to do in projects like this. Indeed, for tram, it was not, not that much included, but in other projects, that's what we're looking into. For example, also the new AI Act that you have on the European level. These are the important things to look at also for these types of projects. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a very valid point, maybe for Cinea to also take on board that you need this multidisciplinarity with the ever increasing complexity in our work. Eh? Okay, Hamid, you wanted to respond? Actually, I think that the most of the thing that I wanted to hear was already said. I think that we need to also start projects at least from the very beginning, incorporate safety and security in our projects. It doesn't work like, you know, words like trust. It means something to us, but uh, go to Russia is something else. So there are plenty of risks, and these are these risks must be included in our studies. And I fully agree with you, Sasha, that we have to have this multidisciplinary uh, engineering way of thinking to put up set up a system that really works <laughs> in the long run. And of course, I fully understand people who don't want to share data because they are afraid of what they are going to, what the responsibility they should take. We need to have those projects to show that we have, we build safe fail system. Even if something happens, the fail safe system, if something happens, it, the consequences are not as such that we cannot treat. So this is very important in these kind of projects. This was my... Thank you, thank you, Hamid. So, um, a clear point, I think. Other questions to the project? Yeah. Oh, first an answer, and then I'll come to you. It's not an answer, but I think it's, there's sometimes a bit of a paradox. So within Tangent, one of the biggest um, barriers to collect data from, for, for modeling from users was to access people's um, like trips on, on Google Maps. So the daily trips for 30 days, this is what uh, the modelers were trying to collect and they faced a huge amount, amount of reluctance. People were saying, no, I don't want to share my data, even if it was within uh, an R&D project with very strict uh, data privacy regulations. But at the same time, most people unconsciously are sharing all this data with Google Maps unless they've physically disabled this. I mean, the private sector has a huge amount of data on the mobility sector. And there's a bit of a paradox in this sense. Um, so I don't have the solutions, but it, it's interesting to see. That's uh, very true. I think once you make people aware of how much they are already sharing, uh, they become reluctant. Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, good point. So, um, question here and then you after, okay? Yeah. Uh, John von Stamm from RWTH Aachen University. So I'm also coordinating a senior call for seven months, also in the transport sector, multimodality, but in a freight transport context. So we certainly have also run into the unwillingness to share data between stakeholders. That's why I also wanted to address RUNA. Um, 
So as I took it, it's more of a willingness factor than a technical factor. Of course, we are talking about uh, data standards and data quality issues as well. But uh, I think one of the key elements is to define and to identify, create new collaborative business models and incentives for sharing data. So that would be my first question. Um, have you created uh, those ones? Are they also going to be published in the white paper? And um, how did you address this problem? And the second question I would have, we heard a little bit about data spaces, the European mobility space, for example, but also uh, centralized platforms. From your, um, from your expertise, from your experience within the project, which kind of route would you want to take if uh, you want to incentivize data sharing? More centralized approach or a decentralized approach with data spaces? Thank you. Okay, so two questions. Huh? Business cases and data sharing. Who, who first? Uh, I can try to answer that regarding data spaces, centralized and decentralized. Uh, I believe there is so much heterogeneous data that a centralized approach will not work. It should be some kind of federated data spaces, multiple data spaces. But for sure, you need some kind of single point of contact providing you with uh, me metadata uh, both regarding what kind of data is available but, but also access rules and covering contractual issues and liability issues and so on does that answer your question somewhat on the data space side but not the business models eh? <laughs> you were still longing for did we did you create business model do you do you, do you feel in the projects? I think we have to admit we have not uh, proven that we have created business models for data sharing that will work after the project knows. So there is still some work to do here, yes. And uh, I previously mentioned the data intermediaries. So we need to ensure that those that share data they have control over the data, uh, who are using their data and for what purpose. And that is going down to contractual issues and trust, of course. Thanks. Other projects who want to contribute here? Uh, yes, I mean, for, from our side, we did, we did actually, uh, we did create business models, but not on the data side, more on the operation side. So for example, uh, because we're looking at these sort of different sort of operators working together, and in some cases, some operators may lose and some other operators may win. Uh, and, and we looked at these sort of kind of scenarios where, uh, in, in particular in Athens, the, the, the high operator is a toll, is a toll or the, the, the road that they operate is a toll road. So you cannot, they wouldn't accept redirecting traffic away from the toll road if there is an accident because of course they lose revenue. So this is where this sort of conflict of interest arises. Uh, so in our case, we look at business modeling from that perspective. Uh, but again, from, from the data side, again, I mean, what you mentioned as well, because I'm involved in logistics, I think logistics is a bit of a separate, different sort of animal when it comes to data. There is a lot of, confidentiality, commercial issues involved about operations, sharing operators, etc. Uh, so again, what we try to do in this case was to, um, because we had this uh, use case in adverb where we had freight operators involved. So again, we just tried to use open data or data collected by the traffic authorities uh, to, to sort of you know, use them as part of the, the traffic management because the projects are mainly for traffic management. We didn't aim to, let's say, optimize specific logistic services. Who's so looking at the traffic management, traffic management as a whole? Uh, but I guess this is something. And like Juliet said, the private data against open public data, and I think there is some unbalance there to some extent. I, maybe Sasha, because um, I was very triggered by the tradable mobility credits. I could imagine a business model there somehow. 
the tradable mobility credits is, <laughs> that, that's going to be a challenge to get it working in practice and that has to do with privacy, with security, but also with legal issues. So hopefully in, an, in, an op, in, a, in a project that started January 1st, we get the opportunity to do that on a small scale, but you already notice that the city of Amsterdam doesn't want us to communicate that much about it. So first we wanted to do it in uh, a city hall, for example, the series game. Now we're going to do it at the AMS conference because it's more scientists together. We invite a special panel of people to, uh, to participate. So it's difficult also as a city to say we um, want a thing like that. And it's not just for the, from the data sharing perspective, but it's also telling people that you are going probably to restrict part of people's mobility. So also these types of aspects are in there. Yeah, that's, that's one thing underlying all the concepts we, we, we are developing, is that they are also somewhat politically sensitive. And, yeah. and they might run into issues there that uh, if you're uh, from a different perspective, you want them at all. Um, I'll, I promise to go to a question there, um, and then I'll come back to you, okay? Running with the mic. Hello. Oh, good well, we have another one. Oh, that's great. Mike. Yeah. So, hello. Good afternoon. I'm Shekhar Pardeshi, working with Global Logic within Hitachi Group, uh, working out of Poland. Um, I work in the field of automotive cybersecurity and automotive functional safety. So, ISO 26262 and ISO 21434. Now, I'm hearing about we are plan. You know, we already have developed several simulations, several models with AI in traffic wherein I, you know, my cybersecurity sense comes out and uh, that makes me think, do we already have a simulation wherein we have a use case such that a malicious node joins a network? What happens then? Do, do we have a possibility to simulate such a thing? Second thing, I already hear that uh, we are defining meta models for data sharing. We have uh, already defined certain uh, protocols for sharing data between different types of modes of modes of transport. The, in my personal opinion, this is the right place for you know having cybersecurity or not just cybersecurity, but uh, having uh, cryptographic security measures in place. Have we already started thinking about those? Thank you. Interesting. That's interesting. What happens in a compromised network? Who who wants to answer? <laughs> Uh, I, I will not answer, but I will just thank you for the idea to introduce cybersecurity into the simulation. So thank you very much. Very interesting. It feeds into the multidisciplinarity, yeah, clearly, because so the cyber perspective would ask you to, th to do that, actually, and say, so somebody is malicious, what happens? Um, Sasha. That's actually a project, that, uh, ID that we submitted, and that, it's called Midas. The, the scary wolf. So it all, the title of the project already um, has in it what, what might happen. So we're thinking about these kinds of things. Can I add something else? We, we talk a lot about data sharing. What we try to do in some projects in the Netherlands is ask the question what information is needed. Do we always need, uh, need to share all the data? I hear a lot of people who want all the data, but what do you actually want to know? Is a, a data on an aggregated level a good answer to what you need? Or can we let certain algorithms run at the source of the data and not put all of the data at one place? So think of other strategies to be able to answer the questions that we have to solve the problems that we have, but not share all that data yeah. and, and not put it in one place if possible. Yeah, that's, that's also a very good thing to add. I would, I was from, the operational perspective also thinking about, well, uh, we have real-time data that has a value for like a minute, and then after that it's waste, and it goes into, let's say, policy evaluation, then it has value again. But this is a sharp distinction between what you would actually need and what you actually use in a, any, uh, any of these concepts. Eh? Um, we have, is your question sufficiently answered? More or less, eh? there was the encryption part you, you asked, but they were all tripping around that. Encrypting the data enough? Do we have uh, uh, cryptographic security measures already in place? Operationally, we do, but I don't. I mean, for, for at least the data we are using, when it comes to things like traffic data, there is no there is no encryption there. I think all there is there is a, again. This is probably another paradox. I think there is a push to go to open data 
which effectively, you know, maybe sort of, um, uh, let's say, counter, counter, counter uh, parts the, 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 the encryption side of things. So there's all this push about having open data. So anything that has to do with, yeah, traffic, uh, data mainly collected from public authorities, these, these are not encrypted. Uh, but I guess when it comes to the operational side of things, I, I think that will be a crucial, crucial thing to do, you know, because, and I guess this is probably one of the things that, um, as uh, we, we discussed uh, before, it's very difficult to try a lot of research results into a real environment at the moment because of a lot of security concerns, safety concerns, etc. So um, I guess security is always going to be something that has to be looked at uh, when you come to, you know, deploying, let's say, information systems. So well, well noted, I think, also, and in, in coming out of a few questions, is that this security and trust needs to also be integrated in the developments of the concept. So we cannot just have a proof of concept without taking notions of, uh, of these risks and, and, and mitigate them already. Question here. Sorry for keeping you waiting, but a good discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> Just going back to your comment about uh, the inno innovativeness of the tradable credits, uh, I think, if I remember well, about 10 years ago, uh, Peso was uh, experimenting with a platform called, I think, iMove or something like that, where you could buy just mobility credits and use it on any vehicle from Peso. And this is about 10 years ago, or even more. I would like to know if you have come across this as part of your research. Apparently, it has failed. And I was wondering if anybody knew, is it because of the lack of uh, dit digitalization, you know, advanced uh, connectivity at that point, or there was something else? But considering that 10, 12 years later, we talk about it as something innovative, or somebody, tri somebody tried, but apparently it didn't work, it will be worth uh, exploring, I think. Okay, so who wants to respond? No, we, we, we did check what was there, but my, uh, to, to fully understand you, do you mean that people earn credits by traveling in a certain way? The other way around, to buy it. Um, We did, uh, not me, but one of the PhD students, an intensive literature survey on that, and I think he would have come across it. And what he has actually been looking at now is how do you uh, distribute credits to people? Are there groups of people that you want to uh, profit more from it? Uh, people with lower incomes, people had, that have certain types of jobs. Um, how to deal with people who need a lot of the credits? Um, do they need to buy them? Um, do you have a role as a government distributing credits between different groups, or is it like a blockchain or a thing like that? To, of the, there are so many of these different aspects to, to be looked at, but it begins with um, the political acceptance of it and also being really willing to try it. And, and hopefully um, we will. Yeah. But, you, but you do need, and then I come back to the security aspect as well, you do need a system that fully feels safe because uh, I have some kind of a banking system somewhere that I don't want to be hacked. And I also want to know that if I reserve something and pay for it, that it's there when I get there. So there are so many other uh, aspects to it than simply um, the idea that this would be a good way of organizing things. Okay. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it, it will not be developed for quite some time eh? and there is still a lot of work to do, in, I think conceptually, um, but also socially. Okay, uh, others want to respond to this question as well or not? If not, then I'll look for other questions in the room, all the way there. I see one or two. You're bringing the mic, Marcena. Great. Hello, Marek Galinsky from Slovakia University of Technology. Uh, we speak a lot uh, about the data, which I think is really good. I have seen in the last project that uh, you've been talking not only about the dashboards, but also about the APIs 
And in my opinion, the data will be federated. There is no option that the, all the data will be centralized and so on. And now, in my opinion, we are in the stage of building these proofs of concepts. But uh, we are before the stage uh, of the mass deployment of what we will call a digital twins or whatever. Uh, so my question is, in my opinion, these systems, they will need to be interoperable. They will need to uh, have some standardized data model and da data interchange. Have you addressed this uh, topic in your projects? And maybe what was the upsides? What was the protocol stacks you were trying to align with? Or what were the downsides of the projects where you find that there is a missing standardization, missing ideas on this? Uh, this is my question. Thank you. Maybe Juliet, for you, this one? Yes. Um, so I think, I don't know about all projects, but for Tangent, it's, it's really a very early stage um, multimodal traffic management system. And I don't think that they've really looked at protocols and connecting and standardizing because um, relating to the question that was answered earlier about business cases, when uh, we started working on exploitation of the services, of the different uh, sub-tools, we asked who wants to exploit um, and make a business case out of the tangent services. We didn't have many volunteers um, in, the, in the consortium because they were telling us, well, tangent is a way for us to test um, and innovate uh, different techniques and different services and different tools and new ways to harmonize data, but it's still too far from actually being deployed at a mass level or making a business case out of it. It's really the beginning of testing. So not there might have been standardization and interoperability, but it's not something that I've heard of in our project. I don't know about you. Are there other, others who want to add? Um, I think in terms of uh, standards, when it comes to transport data, I think there are quite a few standards there for uh, many years now. I mean, Datex to Transex model. So that there's a lot of data standards. I think uh, in our case, of course, we have to to demonstrate this interoperability. So every time you create, um, you know, some sort of a tool, you have to make it so it's sort of compatible with these kind of standards. I think in our case, we we made our tools compatible with Datex two, for example, when it comes to traffic data. Uh, but I think maybe what what could be useful to look at is the evolution of those models and how, because some of those models are about 20, 25 years old, how these have to evolve to, to uh, be fit for purpose for now. Uh, you know, there is data for public transport, um, or sorry, standards for public transport data for many years, but everyone nowadays uses GTFS, which again, something that Google came up with, and it's much simpler than some very heavy data uh, standards that we have in, in, in um, you know, coming from previous EU projects. So uh, I think there must be some way to sort of keep track of this evolution and the need to evolve those standards to, to some more practical, let's say, um, standards for, for, for now. And of course, to incorporate new services that will come in the future as well. Okay, thank you. Others who still want to add? Yes, Lunar? Mm. Yes, there are sev several different standards already, and there are several interfaces that need to be standardized. Uh, I think what is lagging most behind is standards for exchanging information between the traffic managers of different governance areas or different modes. They are totally uh, lacking. Uh, while there exists some standards, uh, and that can be uh, information regarding uh, capacity, demand, and so on. Uh, and then you have another set of standards, which are standards related to communicating the outcome of the traffic management measures towards the network users. There we have several set of standards today, but for sure they need to be detailed and further deployed for road sector, probably based on cooperative ITS messages and so on. Okay, thank, thank you. There was another question here, I think. Yes, Marcena, can you hand the microphone? Thanks. 
Hi. Uh, it was not a question, but just like a comment from Tangent Project because I'm also representing Repress from the Tangent Consortium partners. So just wanted to uh, considering the business model, say, or even the uh, how different authorities use uh, or can we utilize the models because the thing is not every city will go towards investing in infrastructure uh, based on, for example, dynamic congestion pricing. So for, for case in Athens, for example, only there were one of the case studies which were ready to in, like maybe invest in the physical infrastructure for congestion pricing, but only in zone based, not, uh, and some cities were, and for example, uh, Lisbon was focusing more on uh, virtual case. So the, the problem at times is more about politically challenging about where do cities invest in infrastructure uh, for dynamic congestion pricing for as an example and uh, yeah like that was just one comment to uh, to give an overview from the tangents perspective hey, who wants to respond here or no. it's more like a comment not not a question okay, so but. <laughs> it's not really a question eh? so maybe i do have a question unless there's urge, an urgent question from the room ah okay one more I'll come to you. Thank you. I'm Ugo from Ines in Portugal. My question is regarding the impact of electrical and shared mobility in the tools that you are developing. Uh, this uh, electrical mobility will change something or will be exactly the same? Who wants to answer? Did you get the question? Not fully. Could you repeat still? Yes, regarding the electric mobility and shared mobility, what will be the impact in your tools? Ah, okay. So what's the impact of electric and shared mobility in your tools? Did you model for that? Uh, I think in terms of frontier, I think the, especially the shared mobility and, and this additional mobility service is something that definitely has to be looked at because uh, as a project, we focus mainly on the more, let's say, conventional kind of operators when it comes to traffic management, highways, uh, urban traffic control units and public transport operators. But of course, if we need to have a true multimodal traffic management, then all these other operators need to, need to be also uh, involved. So it's not something we looked at in Frontier. Uh, I think when it comes to electromobility, again, that's another dimension that will probably have to play a very important role because, of course, infrastructure needs are quite different. Uh, uh, in our case, uh, again, we didn't go into the detail on the on the real implementations, but we did test some scenarios in in the simulations uh, when it comes to um, electromobility and different fleet penetrations to to some of the sort of strategies um, that that we, we we tested. Okay. Yeah, Juliet. Uh, yes. So. As part of the dashboard, we, one of the function is to test what if scenarios. And uh, the city of um, Rennes Metropole is testing, well, is going to start testing a scenario where one of their corridors that goes into Rennes um, in France would have a lane dedicated only to, share, uh, to shared mobility um, and to shared car, carpooling and all of these different shared um, vehicles. So what would be the impact on the rest of the traffic. Um, it's really a simulation, like they, they won't tr try it out, but it's a bit about looking at mobility differently. So if this is something you're interested in, maybe in a few months, you can read the results on our websites. That's a good cliffhanger, very well. <laughs> Other responses to this or? Yeah, Sasha? Yeah, yes, we do include them for the Amsterdam use case, where we're looking at um, also the, the competition between the shared mobility providers and public transportation because in the Netherlands offering shared mobility often means a reduction in public transport. I just gave the example of ride hailing but that's also when it comes to shared scooters. I think less with shared bikes with, but shared scooters is a problem. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's replacement then, eh? yeah. not addition. Yeah, okay. Hamid has one very short question, I think. Yes. Actually, it's not, why you're not giving the mic to people? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I keep it so I can withdraw it. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm doing it very short. Uh, Sasha, Sasha mentioned that people are asking for data sharing why they need information. I think that is a very right question. What we are doing that, it means that we are going to involve 
people who are service providers, they are data aggregators. Then we can start talking about business models. When they are not there, we are asking about data, we are going to do everything ourselves. It's going to be a problematic, I believe. You are asking the right question. I would like to see that it's coming up as a very important subject for, for these projects. Information is more important than data sharing. Good, good point, I think. Who wants to respond? Agreed? Full accordance, okay. We're running out of time, so we're just four minutes. I would like to ask you, each one of you, um, an important question. What is the next step uh, to progress to implementation of your project results? So when you move beyond the project, um, what needs to be done first? And maybe also to add to that, what's the biggest hurdle? Let, let me start. Um, the, the biggest hurdle is to get it implemented. And, yeah. and that's the biggest uh, step, I think. And, but things very quickly changed. When we looked at the Amsterdam case, we had a, government, uh, we had a local administration that really focused on uh, CO2. Now we have a new one who is much more focusing on, on inclusiveness. So that means in the end, okay, we, we've made the algorithms such, in such a way that we can make these changes, but it does mean that you also have to maneuver when these types of things happen. Somebody just said something about road pricing. We were this close in the Netherlands to getting it implemented. Now we have a completely different um, group of people in charge. I think it won't happen in the next uh, 10 years. So that political willingness and looking a bit further ahead and just the upcoming election period, I think is important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Panos. Yes. Um, I, th I think for us, again, the, the implementation, this is something that we, we found as a big obstacle, you know, because there's a lot of things that we can do and we can, a lot of things that we can simulate, but then it's, it's, uh, it's not the same as, as putting that to the, to the test. So again, this is something that uh, could be looked at in the future and maybe have some protocols. Uh, like, you know, I'm aware of a lot of protocols now for testing CCAM and, and CCAM have been, you know, been tested very th um, widely in the EU with based on those protocols, safety protocols. Maybe we need to do something similar. Maybe we need to have these sort of environments that we can test all those things that have been developed because uh, I think techno or the research is, is quite a few years ahead of what happens in, in, um, in practice. I have an example from my travels today, but I don't think I have time to say that. Uh, but again, this is something I can realize, you know, when, when it comes to information and things that we do in, in research, but in practice, we are probably quite a few years behind. Thanks. Bruno. I think I already stated in my presentation what the biggest barrier is towards uh, deployment of this data sharing. Uh, but I also think that uh, all of our project has provided some building blocks that can provide some way forward towards this. But uh, I have to admit my dream is that in a couple of years we stop talking about data sharing but start talking about new innovative measures for traffic management. That's uh, transport demand management uh, in a zone, demand capacity balancing between zones or between different governance areas, uh, individualized urban vehicle access regulation and so on, and also looking into the new possibilities brought by CCAM vehicles and uh, automated vessels at sea. So that's my dream, talking Thank about you. the measures. Last but not least, Juliet. Uh, yes. <laughs> So I hope that, um, so Tangent, as I said, was a bit of a stepping stone, I think, for many organizations to a bigger future where we can really implement multimodal traffic management. And I think that hopefully the biggest um, value of Tangent would be that it has small systemic changes in each organization that was part of the project and that they will continue um, advocating for multimodality and sustainability and a more holistic system. And the biggest hurdle is that when the project ends, there's always a risk that um, some of the findings don't get exploited as they should. But I also think that uh, projects have a very strong identity and people 
um, continue to own the results and they start to, you start seeing them in new projects because it's the same organizations that are participating in the new calls. So hopefully they can bring a little bit of every project into the next ones. Thank you. Great. So we're right sharp at four o'clock and we promise to quit at four o'clock to give you a break. I would like to answer so you, if you move from the research to the implementation, you might get a bit down that how long it takes, but I would like to end with a positive word because we are trying to reinvent a system that has evolved over hundreds of years with many layers and complexities and you want to do and it has a lot of impact on, on everybody's lives if you're changing this. You're also doing it while keeping it running. It's not that we can all stop being mobile for a couple of years and then something new is built. Um, so I want to thank you as the researchers for uh, opening up on, on the work you've done. It's always being a bit vulnerable and sharing what you've done and for trying and having the courage to re-envision what we're actually doing, uh, developing these concepts. I think it's really useful and don't be discouraged. Just to give a small example, we did the Socrates 2.0 uh, project a couple of years ago and now we found the political situation, the stars were aligned that we can actually introduce a lot of the concepts of, of this project. So it takes then three, four years after it's finalized, you see something actually being implemented. So um, on a positive note there, I would like to ask for a big round of applause for the researchers. So then thanks Tiago also for moderating the first part and uh, yeah, it's off to the break, thanks a lot.